you. Sweet. You. Okay, let's multitask. Water. Hello. Oh, thanks for coming up so early and probably on most people's last day of the working world in 2018. Let's just talk. Right, I'm talking about tradition. Thank you guys for having me today. Um, when I got given this topic, I freaked out because initially I thought this would be easy. I actively try and avoid tradition and I think that I'm quite good at running away from what you're meant to be doing when you run a business. Um, but the further I kind of looked into this, I kind of realised that I am deeply embedded in tradition because I make cakes. And cakes are the most traditional thing that I think you can plunk on a table. Um, the ceremony of a cake is always connected to family, place, home. I mean, who would not want to eat this hedgehog <laughs> slash dog? <laughs> and if you think about it, um, the... The whole purpose of cakes is really to connect people and um, you can take that way back to the beginning of time, which is where I'm taking you. I feel like I need an echo on this. You, you, you. Um, Middle Ages is actually when cakes started to get involved with society and um, round cakes. Why do we eat round cakes? Well, it's because of these guys. They wanted to worship the sun and the moon and we still eat round cakes because of that which I think is pretty fascinating. Um, you know, you think about the Chinese, they have moon cakes, which is for their lunar goddess, and ancient Slavs used to create round cakes for worshipping the spring sun. And even the Celts, they would roll giant round cakes down a hill to kind of um, mimic the motion of the sun and ensure that the world kept spinning. So there's this real beauty to do with cakes that I think a lot of people don't really recognise. And I find it really fascinating, which is kind of why I'm so drawn to it. Um, so moving ahead in history, we've got the uh, 17th century is really when the beautiful desserts that we know it really came into being. This is one of the first cake recipes in the world. I like how you have to let it slant until it is blood warm. Let's do that. Um, so by now... Cakes were really infiltrated in society. It was um, ancient symbolism and mythology, and now it was getting into the mainstream. And for me, wedding cakes are really what carries on the tradition, and they're crucial in tradition in all of our families, mostly. <sighs> this is actually my grandparents' wedding cake. And um, in World War II, cakes were still so important that even though sugar was forbidden, you couldn't use it at all people would make cardboard cakes and they would mask it in plaster and hire it out on an hourly basis. So I just think that that's just amazing that cakes still are so involved in people's, you know, rites of passage. And the tradition of eating cake on major occasions has stayed the same from right from the very beginning. It's still socially meaningful. Cake mixes, again, were really when they really got domesticated and um, that one on the top left is being able to make your mother proud. And psychologists at the time, they found that their original cake mix mixes had just added water, but that wasn't enough. People still needed to have that connection to cakes. They needed to add an egg or a bit of milk. And once cake mixes started doing that, it just took off. So people are still inclined to get involved in the process and that has meaning in um, connecting them to the table. So that is your history lesson over. Let's talk about me. My history with cake. A lot of people say, ask me, do I, um, have I, you know, grown up in a baking household? Was my mum an amazing baker? No, not at all. I've never baked anything in my life up until I was about 27. This is the first cake I ever made. I was extremely proud of it. Um, but what I did find out was that I do have a long tradition of hospitality in my family. This is my granddad. He was a banquet manager at hotels all around London. And behind him was my nan who had a little catering company called Lucy's Lunches. And she would trawl around the slough trading estate where the office was filmed. It's that miserable. 
and she'd have a little trolley with egg sandwiches. So there's this real kind of deep-rooted sense of serving people and, I don't know, perform. it is kind of like performance in some aspect as well, I feel. Um, yeah, so I do come from a long line of cooks, caterers and also butlers, which I think is mildly funny. Um, and there is this cultural historian, I'm going to read a quote because I thought it was beautiful. She wrote a book called Cake, A Global History. And she says, cake is a sentimental object imagined first and foremost as an act of love, an offering of time and skill, sweetness and pleasure. And I think that's what really drew me to cakes. I find it really meditative. You're thinking of the person. You can't really think of anything else because if you stuff up, it's going to be a disaster. You're thinking of the ingredients, you're measuring it out, and there's always that person or that event at the end. I just find that really beautiful. So I knew I wanted to open a bakery. I had no pastry chef skills. I did not have a shop. I did not have enough savings to do anything. And when we think of a bakery, we think of long hours, there's flowers on, flour on the floor. There's windows stacked full of amazing treats and dubious treats. So how was I going to do that without an actual bakery, a physical space? And the way I decided to do that was to bring the cakes to the people. And at the time I was playing music and we toured America. Before every sound check, we'd try and duck into a lot of bakeries and just sample what was going on. And at the time, cupcakes were just starting to peak. It was around 2008, something like that. And so I decided to bring cupcakes back to Melbourne. And again, no physical space. What was I going to do? I thought I would fang around Melbourne in a little beat up car and just deliver cupcakes to anyone that wanted it. So you could get a six pack or a 12 pack of cupcakes. There's a little swing tag telling you what music the cakes had been listening to in the kitchen at the time. And um, at the time, cupcakes were very classic, very beautiful, very pretty. And I just wanted to kind of amp it up a little bit. So the flavours were odes to Elvis and Prince and a lot of American desserts and they were very boozy and just big on flavour. And that kind of, you know, I was kind of lucky because of the, the band I was in, I got quite a lot of press about the business and that really helped me have the word spread. But then I needed to actually get out there and come up with different ways to create a new type of bakery. And I wanted something transient and something that um, could, could let people sample what I was doing and also feel connected to a bit of a community. This was a um, tasting party I held at Wooly Bully. I don't know if anyone went there. It was like a record store, comic store. It was so great. And I literally gave out hundreds of cake. And um, there was a little zine that people could pick up. And people that came to that event still come to my events now. So I had a cookbook come out this year. And people were still coming up nine years later. So I feel like it was a, a really cool chance for people to just understand what I was doing. Um, the next event I did was called Hungry Eyes and it was a mini film festival which was at Long Play in North Fitzroy and you basically got to eat the sweets that you were seeing on screen. I picked some really terribly good movies. There's this B-grade Canadian movie called Blood and Donuts that you should all download immediately. Um, Comfort and Joy was actually a real life story about ice cream truck gang war in Scotland. So um, I always tried to kind of just keep things a little bit different, but it was genuine because it was things that I loved to do anyway. Um, and probably the most ambitious one I did was called Sweet Easy. This was an all-you-could-eat tropical buffet that was an ode to my favourite punk ballad, Whole Wide World by Reckless Eric. So again, I just want to say it is just me. I have no staff members at all, and I made so much avoca avocado lime mousse um, coconut macaroons. I've had to teach myself on the spot what pandan leaves were, figure out how to infuse coconut cakes and just did it. So there was over 180 people that came to that event and they were hungry. <laughs> there was a lot of cake and um, there was also a zine all about stiff records and just the tropical ingredients that I'd used. And as an aside, I do want to say that uh, a lot of the times when I come to talks where I'm hearing about how people do things, I always want to know the difficult bits because I think that's really important. Sometimes things can 
look easy and carefree and it is and it's exciting but I think it's important to say that um, all these events were really hard to pull off and um, they were worth it but I just want to give you a reality check. Um, so look after all these events the inevitable happened and people started asking me for wedding cakes. I had already done quite a lot of big cakes before because I had a lot of um, clients in the arts community they were asking me to do quite flamboyant big cakes. I've I've worked for the Australian Ballet, Romance Was Born, um, Malthouse Theatre, ABC Studio. So all those kind of clients were pushing me to do these bigger cakes. And then I got my first wedding cake call and my first reaction was, please do not let me make a wedding cake. Um, for some reason, I just didn't, I did not want to do it. I thought that they were just architecturally impossible, too ornate, not my thing. But... Luckily, the same thing happened where people were actually coming to me now because they knew my, my vibe and what I was into doing. And I've actually made over 750 wedding cakes now. And I'm, I'm more known for like a free form look and I've bent what is expected in wedding cakes. All the flavours rely on native ingredients, um, vegetables, herbs, edible flowers. They're a real sweet, savoury balance. And um, from that came my signature style, which is kind of um, moving away from overly sweet cakes. And that was becoming my trademark. And from that, I, um, I got to publish my own book this year through Heidi Grant and Chronicle Books. I think over 4,000 copies have been sold so far. And it's been featured in the Washington Post, Food 52, um, or your kind of local publications as well. With the um, cookbook, it was really important for me, again, to not do a traditional baking book. Um, throughout my career, I'd kind of wanted to make the visuals really interesting, which my husband is mainly responsible for, the poor guy. But um, I didn't want it to be too pretty. I didn't want doilies. I didn't want crunched linen. I think that there's a real beauty in that. But for me, I just constantly wanted to just push what was expected and try and provide something a little bit more interesting. So all the photography in the book, um, most of it was Tim Hillier, who's an amazing local photographer. We wanted to keep things really lo-fi, natural lighting. And I wanted to do that because I wanted people to feel like it was an approachable activity, taking the fear out of baking, making it, remind them of the times that they've had with family and friends and creating their new traditions. Let's create a new cake for a housewarming party, a divorce party, whatever you want to do. And, um, yeah, and the recipes itself as well were very honest. The writing style, I wanted to be um, not, not over the top, just really humble and real. There's a lot of elements about growing your own food as well because I did steer away from supermarket aisles, even though I started with the traditional cupcake craze. Um, I found turning to the plant world and the edible gardens kind of re-inspired me and I looked at new ways of creating cake recipes from that. And I wanted it to be um, realistic. So it's a sprawling, messy garden. It's, I'm not an urban farmer with aprons I can't do that and I, I want to bring that across so that honesty I think kind of breaks the rules a little bit and hang on it's growing yeah so I, I mean I think that's it I'm, been, I'm known for championing underused ingredients and kind of doing the wrong things I, I'm not a bakery I don't have a shop I kind of pick different areas to connect with people and what I find beautiful about recipes is that all recipes have roots in somewhere. And especially with baking, you can't fuck around with the method, but you can play around with the ingredients and the techniques. And that kind of gives you scope to be creative. But I think the tradition of recipes and um, the pillars of how you should do things are always in place. And I also love how recipes can be passed down from generations. I'm pretty sure we all have a memory of a pavlova or something beautiful that we've eaten that can instantly take us back to a place. When my book came out, I had a um, parcel in the mail and um, it was a bit of a surprise. 
It's called The Royal Cookery Book by Mrs. McKee. And that's my last name, in case you've forgotten. And it actually turns out that I thought I was forging the way forward. Amazing that I was just so happy that I'd been published. I've got my attitude out into the baking world. But no, it's all been done before and in the most traditional way possible. Mrs. McKee was a um, Swedish lady and she married my great grandmother, my great grandfather's brother, Jimmy McKee. And um, she was the first female chef that cooked for the royal family. It was incredibly traditional and so awful, the imagery. But um, I just thought it was really amazing that there's this underlying tradition of baking out there. And, um, you know, this topic has kind of made me really reflect on what I'm doing. And as I said to Jeremy, it actually muddled me up quite a bit because I did think that I was quite punk and I was bending conventions, but I'm not. I'm actually working in the most traditional thing you can do. Um, I'm not a traditional bakery. I'm not a traditional baker because I'm coming at things from a new angle. But the industry in and the occasions that I cater for and my family tree are tying me back to the past. So to round up, a very quick talk, guys. What are we on? There you go. To round up, I think... Um, Tradition's really beautiful because you can run away from it only so much, but it's always going to be in the background, um, always behind the scenes, kind of steering, steering you into what you're doing. And um, although my first instincts are to run away from tradition and do things in a new way, I do think that traditions are inescapable and it gives you roots, but it gives you room to reinvent too. That's it. Thank you.